Well, this means I'm bringing and I'm going to recite a few poems as well as essays from my book, The Umbringa Said Edition. This is the hardcover edition. Well, I'm going to recite uh, Ode to Europe, a say from my book, The Umbringa Said Edition. Wait, this is the reverse I know. Ode to Europe. Wait, wait. Whoops, can't you do it? Who gives a crap? I don't. Well, this is out to Europe. And it goes out to Europe. Hey, great Europe, and only your mother, whose caresses we've been nurtured with. Ever since our birth, we've fleshed our duties towards you, to hear your name wherever we may be. To never shun your heritage from now on to infinity. Great Europe, your artistry and architecture are surpassed by none. You who shall be reawakened at the, at the beginning of this dawn, the dawn of a new era, as everlasting and splendorous as the sun. Great Europe, whose pristine beauty demands admiration, where your culture bears faithful adherence of your divinity, protectors of your identity, never fear the generation. Great Europe, under this moonless sky, I bow down to your presence. Am I truly worthy of your every glory, certainly heavens? Great Europe, mother of Dante and Beethoven, gods in their own league, how could I approach your majesty with just my native tongue to speak? Great Europe, such beauty indescribable by mere words, your immaculate charisma shall ever be a sure joy, only to be felt. Great Europe, an ideal goddess without comparison, I shall hail your mighty name in due time. Until then I shall await this day, and trans by a beauty so divine. Well, that was my OT Europe. And up next is, well, Divine Entity. Well, this is going to be Divine Entity. As before, I managed to succumb to another epic fail. As it's horizontally in first, on the webcam, the way it appears on the webcam, but anyway, here is Divine Entity. Okay, enough of the humorous parts, the seriously uh, eccentric parts and uh, stupidly funny parts. Here are the remaining serious parts, which aren't that much in this video, but anyway, here they are. This is uh, Divine, en Divine Entity, and it goes Divine Entity. Am I really talking to an angel? A divine entity with wings that span forth unto infinity? Why does every time I talk to you seem so surreal? Like a vivid fantasy that seems so lifelike. Are you the goddess whose lips I bite every night in a, passion, in a frenzy of passion and ecstasy? Come, my Aphrodite, seduce me until I beg for surrender. Tease me with phrases invigorating to the soul and mind alike. Challenge me with death beyond my capabilities. Enlighten me with dictums from the far essence of this world. Enrage me, infuriate me. Wrench my, my frigid hands from your face whenever I hear to caressing you. Empower me, dominate me. Stretch my physical and psychological boundaries until my body breaks down into atoms. Distort my, my perception of reality. Entice me with aphrodisiacs. Soothe me with tunes from heavenly harps and bring me to utter satisfaction. Be my source of protection in times when I am in dire need, for even the most ardent of men need comforting in times of hardship. Acquaint me with your heart for desires. Let me be your effort apprentice, ever keen on submitting to all of your requests. Set me on a collision course of love and rage, with both polarities lusting for dominance unwaveringly. Savor each moment we share amorous experiences, for this is the day we might drift away towards casting destinations. Well, that was my divine entity. And up next is... If. A poem from my book, Dumberinga. Well... I'm going to stop this video from resulting into an utterly epic fail and go with my reading and stop dropping bookmarks, as I just did. This is completely improvised. Real, like real life TV, except the Zombrick is the greatest man that ever lived on earth. But anyway, the greatest lyrical genius, 
poetical, artistically, and lyrically a genius. Dambringa. With his book, Dambringa, second edition. Well, here it goes. If. If Dionysus was amongst us, who would blush? If Apollo lives, he might as well join in the madness and dance in the least rush. If Shakespeare has seen what would become of us, we would have seen his tragedies as prophecies, unrequited cool love, flattery and blindness to the truth, project teens becoming a big reality. If Freud had known what this humanity has shown, who would have seen disorders as every man's different order of traveling the path he has sown? If Nietzsche knew what the future had held, the offerman would have been unforeseeable. For how can the solitary seagull be seen in the soul consuming herd? If you have just read my plea, know that this is mankind, a breed that shall bring its own destruction. If we never stop, reflect, and see. Well, that was my epic win moment! With my if! Okay, I know I'm shouting, but who gives a toss? I don't! Then all your speakers if you really bother by it, damn you! Okay, well... <laughs> I'm going to recite something really serious now. I sit alone. I sit alone, crying. People tell me it would get better, but it is not. I am dying. Though my death is just figurative, there is no hope in living anymore. No use trying. Without you I feel lost. It is useless denying. Well that was a really serious part of my book. Even though this uh, video which is overall humorous, but anyway. Well, here is my immortality. Taken from the beginning of chapter 6. The Resurrection of Man. In my book, Don Bring a second edition as well as third edition. I know it's horizontal and inverse on the webcam, but, as I just said, who gives a crap? I don't. You, the viewer, should it? So, nobody should give a crap. I don't give a crap about anything in my life, so why should you? I'm a really energetic man, I'm positive, and I don't really don't give a crap about anything else in my life, except for me. Me, 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 me. Okay, I'm an egocentric thought, but anyway. Well, the selection of man. Immortality. What if we were given the chance to be immortal? The chance to live an infinite life? The chance to be able to see the years go by in front of us without even having an inkle? Would that be ideal? One might say that while the concept of an everlasting life might seem quite appealing, one should also consider that what drives us to push ourselves further, to accomplish goals that we would never have thought possible in the past, is the same thing that we fear. That is mortality. Knowing that our time here on this earth is not infinite. We might fear that our life here might, might be a short life, or that we might live a relatively long life for nothing, not having accomplished anything, not having succeeded in time and energy consuming feats. Thus, from our perspective, while living comfortably and not giving thought to what we might be doing tomorrow may seem remarkably mind easing, one also has to consider some of us might end up in a point of our lives one will feel like we have not accomplished anything noteworthy. I am of the belief that there can be no immortality to these mortal vestiges, the body. But there is immortality to the soul. For once we die, physically, our body may rot, but the spirit lives on, onto another body. The spirit having both physical and psychological command. I see this in the way that we think. There is something before that. Something that controls them. Something that has power over them. The same ways to which you have command over your thoughts before you act. Or will your body to do something. A spiritual ancestry in common determines to a certain extent what we become and the way we will our thoughts. Even though we might be of a different psychological makeup than past incarnations. We are born with predisposed traits from previous sites that are combined with the psychological traits we are born with. Both of these traits change according to what we go through in this current life, with both being dependent on genetics and physiology. The psychological makeup of our forefathers and the physical brain we are born with, the psychological capabilities found therein. There is the brain, 
a physical entity, and there is the mind, the spiritual entity. Well, that was my truly awesome essay. Immortality. From my chapter 6, Dumbringa. This direction of man. Okay, this is starting to seem like a epic fail, as I seem like I do not remember my book. But I don't really like to read my own book a lot of times during the day uh, on, a, on a daily basis. I really don't. I love it, yes, but I've read it too many times to be a pompous to watch and read my book all the time and only, and only my book all the time. I have things to do with my life, like reading other books. Like reading other uh, books from noteworthy writers, like Norman Lowell, the politician who wrote the forward to my book, and another really uh, bright guy who also uh, has a prominent part in our political movement in Parima Europa. And this is, this guy is, C. Marcus Adeus. He writes well. We are actually on quite equal terms in uh, uh, regards writing wise. We are both the literary gods, you may say, also. We write divinely, in a divine manner, and in a spiritual moving manner. And as always, it's improvised and completely eccentric. But who gives it us? I don't. You shouldn't. So, who gives it us? Bye. Well, I'm awesome and I know it. And I'm also a poet. And I just dropped the senior bar. But who gives it us? I don't. But anyway. Look, the senior bar is there. Look. Well, I just broke my room lamp light. And I have no adequate lighting. But who gives that to us? I don't. You shouldn't. But anyway. Well, I'm going to recite my The Immortal Ascension of the Sword for Seagull. Well, in any case, the show must go on, even though I dropped my lamp light. But anyway. Where, where the heck is my the portal station of the search seagull? I just lost my mind with my lamp light. So I'm grieving. Okay, so I'll stop the grieving now and get on with the immortal station of the search seagull. Okay, well, here it goes. The immortal station of the search seagull. Clarity is granted to confusion. Order through chaos. Light through darkness. The true Apollo is created through the wisdom of the Dionysus, the man that finds true rationality, through wisdom he gains with reckless passion. The duality of man, set on horrors embodying the mortal vestiges, with both absolute sustain for command. Which command is chosen by man? Man is never truly entirely evil or good, it is what he chooses to be. Out of the life path he sees as more suitable to him, to his purposes, to his needs, to his capabilities. There is both darkness and light to be found in man, if that's what he chooses to succumb to, what he sees as being true light. The light of the many, or the darkness of the few, slave morality or master morality. Those who have chosen the light have enlightened none. Those who have chosen the darkness have enlightened many. The other men that have risen above the masses, discarding their altruistic morality in an effort to purge men of their orthodox mundane ways of life. Those who have achieved critical acclaim, historical grades. Over men who have been a testament of resilience against so many, only to reign supreme over their minds. An ultimate bid for psychological supremacy. The true light, shedding the dim, ragged drops of the herd in a battle that shall lighten the masses with that which they have opposed so passionately, the ultimate terrain of master morality over slave morality. That which was seen as darkness only to be, to be revealed as light, a time when men shall truly see a radical change in our patterns of thinking and living. Oh well. That was my The Immortal Ascension of the Sorcerer Seagull, 
and this clip is beginning to be way too eccentric. But, like I said, who gives a toss? I am still grieving over my lamplight. Ah, ah, ah. Here it is. The lamplight I am grieving. I am grieving about. Wait. This is my lamplight. I just lost it. See? This is totally spontaneous. Improvised. Well, I'm going to end this part of the script now before I cause any more major damage in my room. And well, there's Zombrio signing off until some few more minutes later when I recite some more essays and poems. Bye. Well, as stated, I am still grieving over my damn lap light. <sighs> and instead of it, I'm using this. Look, it's on my laptop. Well, I'm going to... Damn! Damn you! Webcam, damn you! Not holding still! Well, I'm still grieving from my loss of my lamplight. Ah! And instead, I'm using something way less useful. Well, I'm going to recite my. Uh, the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper has come. My fate I shall await. The infernal lakes of Hades, or angelic harps at pearly gates. I shall have to know soon. It is better to face the inevitable. I will just wither away under this benevolent moon. Will I be mourned, or will they rejoice? No much to do now. I don't have much of a choice. Who shall be my companions in this ethereal journey? Who shall accompany me? And this deathly woe, not is to be shed now. My breath is turning out. Can barely write this. Just my final attempt at taking a bow. No one in this death. No sacrilege to be about. No cheer ups. No melodic angels. No hearkening crown. No ascension. No nothing. Just a descent into despair. Just falling. Down. 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 I knew this before, I had foreseen it all. I just thought, thought it unimaginable, for I knew I had such control. Power is turning into weakness, pride into ashes. Leave it rot on my country's soil, the only way I should perish. Well, that was my The Grim Reaper. And here is Life After Death. Life After Death. The notion of heaven and hell is just a fantasy mechanism that the church uses to keep its adherence under its grasp, in the same way as the Ten Commandments and the notion of original sin are used. Think about it, the Ten Commandments are put to the, to the church's use, and that they are so inherent to mankind, all of them have been broken throughout, throughout our history, so we do them naturally, it is in our nation, that we always commit so-called sins. And we will always have to attend mass as a, as a result to repent. Do these social control mechanisms not seem to be obvious and that it is not too apparent that the church uses them as a means to make sure that people will always keep coming back to its institutions? No matter what, the people will always commit sins. And thus because of the feelings of guilt that we have been raised with, we could always feel like we, we would have to repent. Unless we would have we would get rid of guilt feelings entirely and realize that we should not do certain actions towards a certain person persons. Just because we should be human and respect them as human beings, not because certain actions are bad or evil in themselves. So thus, another matter to be taken into consideration is this. We should not see certain actions as immoral or evil. But we should realize that we always affect people with our actions. If we affect a person badly, there is a much larger chance that the person will either affect us or others badly as a result. Guilt trips are of course an inter interrelated mechanism that the church uses to its advantage. Do we actually solve anything by feeling guilty about something? Is it not worse to have guilt feelings and desires and make others feel guilty because you, you would end up feeling guilty yourself? 
is it not much easier for the church to have fervent followers when they feel guilty all the time and thus have to repent regularly? I think so. Don't you? Does it not make you think that we depend on humans who are just as sinful as us? And that those who act holier than thou are usually the ones that feel the need to repent most because they feel so ashamed and guilty about their actions. There is no heaven, there is no hell. You would only make this life an infernal existence if you would torture yourself with the idea that you would be going to hell. What better way is there to control a populace than to make it feel guilty for sins that are within our nature to do? Don't you think? I do, actually. Well, that was my Life After Death essay from my Dombria Chapter 6. Well, I think that I have caused enough damage in my clips for today. So, I'm going to have a sick, really cool like, you know, like Patrick Bateman and his American Psycho. Which was actually Christian Bale as the draw, but anyway. As uh, Patrick Bateman what was uh, Brad Easton Alice's creation uh, role. Uh, character which uh, Christian Bale played in uh, the American Psycho movie, you know. So I'm gonna just actually cool and smoke a cigarette like Patrick Bateman does after killing Paul when he says, Hey Paul! You know that part. Don't you remember it, don't you? You do not? Damn you! Well, I'm going to do what I just say here. Simply irresistible. Bye.